This video was produced by to the image at all, what kind of information do we learn from that image? And also, how does that image make us feel? So as you look at this image, of course, each of you would interpret that a little bit differently. But today, what's so exciting, it's always exciting to me when we can think about the power of art and the power of images and connect them with discursive language. So to be able to work with Furious Flower and think about poetry and our wonderful guest artist today who combines her art and her poetry to teach us about our humanity. This is going to be a wonderful event, one I think you will remember for a long, long time. So at this point, I would like to thank Dr. Joanne Gavins for her wonderful, wonderful work. And she is going, she's here today to introduce our guest speaker, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, one of the great things about moving into a space like this is that it's people with wonderful, warm people, like uh, Dr. Schwartz and uh, Gary Freeberg, who is the curator of the uh, Duke Gallery. And if you haven't seen the latest exhibit, you must get in there to see paper cuts. Phenomenal. There's a piece in there that's a tornado. And really, you feel the whirling of the tornado. The intricate uh, paper cuts. Uh, how many artists are represented? Seven artists, so you might want to see that. But it's my pleasure to be here and to be here with you all and see all of your bright faces waiting for our speaker today. I want to make sure that you know, those of you who are here uh, in, with the Passport Program, that after the reading is over, the uh, beautiful Elizabeth Hoover sitting in the back, uh, she will uh, be available to stamp your passport. I want to thank the faculty members who are here, uh, who've encouraged your students to come. And certainly I want to thank my colleagues from around the region who've come over to hear our speaker. This is a real pleasure for me, um, because I'm bringing to campus someone who has been here before, but who has never been here to read. And we thought on the occasion of the launching of her book, her newest book, that we would bring her back. I have known, Elizabeth, uh, known Rachel Eliza Griffith uh, since 2010, when she came here as a part of the legacy seminar for Lucille Clifton. Uh, she called and asked, uh, could she come? And I heard about her reputation as a photographer. And I said immediately, yes. And when she got here, she took some fabulous pictures of Lucille Clifton, the poet, Nikki Finney, the poet. And she had the good sense to include me in one of those photographs. I just, I'm kidding. 
but it's one of my treasured photographs, the one with Lucille Clifton. So thank you for that, Eliza. As I remember, we opened Lucille Clifton's final reading with a showing of Rachel Eliza Griffith's photographs. And they were photographs of writers and poets playing, if you will, in the light of her calculated shadows. Then I did not know of her facility with the word, with poetry. Her love of light and shadow that can be expressed on the page. In a eulogy for her mother, she writes, quote, lighting the shadow, a woman crawls out beneath her own wars. In another poem, she projects us into space and allows us to see celestial contrast in these lines. Quote, only then can I imagine how light breaks over the earth and does not forgive its innocence. Her latest book, Lighting the Shadow, has received praise from MacArthur Fellow Terrence Hayes, as well as Pulitzer Prize winning poet Tracy K. Smith. They both talk about her ability to decipher the deep slurs of silence, the surreal that mimics reality, and the language that is radiant in its ability to capture loss, love, and transformation. Because of the light that is Rachel Eliza Griffith, I am sure that you will come away from this reading with brightness that will illuminate the dark places of her difficult and challenging subjects. So would you beautiful people give a rousing welcome to Rachel Eliza Griffith. Hello everyone. I am uh, beyond delighted and grateful to be here with all of you today. Um, as Dr. Gabin said, you know, I've been here in different ways um, several times, and it's a gift for me to, to come and share poetry with you and to share imagery with you and to hopefully have a conversation um, about images and poetry and text and language and their relationship. Um, I'm going to read some poems from my new collection, Lighting the Shadow. And I'll kind of um, give you just a little bit of information, some threads, so that you can kind of follow along. Um, most of the poems I'm reading today are going to be part of, in 2010 actually, I traveled down to Mexico, to Coyacan, to Casa Azul. Um, there's a painter who once lived there. Her name was Frida Kahlo. How many of you are familiar with Frida Kahlo? A lot of you. Um, you would know her uni brow and her fierce flower crowns. Um, and so I, I was writing about Frida Kahlo before I actually really had kind of like gone to her kitchen and seen her plates and seen her gardens and seen her paintbrushes. Um, and so I thought that um, that was an important thing. And so in the course of the book, there are several different um, kind of, I want to call them like my kind of muses who kind of run through the book. And so she's one of them. Um, but I'd like to start with just the very first poem in the collection, and it's called The Dead Will Lead You. And many of the, image, many of the poems in this book, um, they're connected to some kind of visual image. And so the image in this particular um, poem um, was an image I came across in the news where there were children who, who had been um, victims of, of chemical warfare in Syria, and they were laid out in these kind of white kind of shrouds. And so that was kind of the beginning of me thinking about um, kind of what the dead say to the living and what the living say to the dead. The dead will lead you. Across scarred meadows, red, blue, white, the star-flung sky scrapes gold grass, unknown milk, endless the stone figures in the fields. Who will embalm our bones? 
Shattered inside of mythologies, we are idols praised by blood and sun. You will call and listen for the children, cradled in moonlight, side by side, their silence deranged, deflowered by ghost primers. Years pulse the skull, the ashen hills, the expanse of desert shorn with prayers. You walk alone through mirages, museums, eyelids, water, estuaries, where wings repeat flight until this desire is memorized. This is what you must learn by heart. The closed flesh as commandment, a terracotta smear of fingerprints praying along the blue cave. Mercy is the pulse of lupin in a yellow field. My mother's eyes are forgotten vases of irises. Lighting the shadow, a woman crawls out from her own war. Ruin, I have lived in your estate. I remember the night horses, reckless with beauty, when the trembling poured through my windows. The animals surrounded my bed as we floated through the house, the world without sail, anchor, ornament, or oar. My memory was a painted mast, filled with the inviolate breath of what history can blow apart. The Woman and the Branch. My mother gave me her bluebird of happiness. Actually, before I begin, I'm going to tell you a little story. I don't think I've, I've just started reading this book, so it's kind of like that new taste. Like when you taste something, you think it's amazing, and then it's new, and you're kind of like, do these things go together? And they do, and it's going to be amazing. So I hope we like have fun that you'll, you'll talk in like energy, you know? That, that feels good to me. I, there feels like a lot of light and energy, and so I want to affirm that. But I also want to tell you this story. When I was younger, my mother had this little kind of like glass bluebird. It was a bluebird of, of happiness is what it was called. And I had this plastic, I'm going to date myself here. I had this plastic Smurf lunchbox, and she let me take it to, for show and tell. And so I, I put it inside this Smurf lunchbox, and somehow getting into a lunchbox fight with someone in my class, the tail on the bird cracked um, and it fell off and I felt like I'm gonna have to find some place to, else to live, like I can't go home with this bird like this and it was this thing my mother loved. And so um, lately as I'm thinking about my mother who passed away this summer, I've been starting to try to like think at the beginning of how small I was and, and all of the different things she gave me. Um, in this case I got punished but, um, <laughs> The Woman in the Branch. My mother gave me her bluebird of happiness. Carrying the glass inside my skin to school, I was young. Show us what you have, the world said. I was polishing somebody's rapture. It wasn't mine. Not my paradise or my mother's love, but oh God, how it shone. I could never tell which bird was singing. I went home like a canticle to its branch. I flew through gray leaves away from my childhood. I gave my mother answers I knew. Didn't ask whether there was another color. Was blue right after all? Was happiness a song to be shattered? I couldn't explain the frailty, how the figurine had cracked when I looked through its life. Thank you. You're gonna give her some energy. <laughs> Thank you. You know, um, just to pause. You yeah. Know, There is the one way of doing it, and then there's the African way of doing it, the call and response way of doing it. Uh, some of us need call and response, and I need it. So we need for you to hear. If you 
hear something that you like, applaud. If you hear something that you aren't sure about, say, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that. <laughs> So I had, as I mentioned before, I had several kind of muses um, as, as I was kind of writing this book, which I wrote over a number of years now. Um, and, and it's this thing in, with poetry where books kind of sit inside us, in our ribs and kind of in our bodies um, longer than most things. So like books take like dog years. It takes that long to like write a book of poetry. Um, you can easily spend, you know, five to 10 to 12 years on a, on a single book of poems. Um, while I was writing, in my last book I, I published, one of my muses was Nina Simone. She's one of my favorite, favorite singers. And so in this book, kind of my musical guide, um, I was quite surprised, ended up being Johnny Cash. So <laughs> this poem is called a Disarming of Shadow, Arming of Light. I wish I were like Johnny Cash and thought my heart was mine. I've worn a black suit my entire life. It suits the war my eyes ignite. My sins sit on my lap, bald, blind, desperate for the mercy of lost roads and glottal white lines. Only smoke will take me far to nowhere. A woman living between her own burning road and a charmed god, the unmarked sky where a plague of blackbirds fell across my back like an unlit cross. This next poem is called The Reckoning of Relics. Um, I think as a poet, we're often, um, we often kind of look at things this close and this close and this close and this close. Um, we like to kind of look at things, um, and the photographer in me and the painter in me also does this thing where I like to pull things apart and put them back together and pull things apart and put them back together. Um, and this can be said too um, when it comes to being in conversation with other poets and other writers' lives. And so um, maybe two years ago, I stayed for the summer in upstate New York. I live in, I'm from Brooklyn. Um, but I'd gone upstate to work on this book and um, I went to the estate of the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay. Um, some of you may be familiar with her. And uh, while I was there, so her house is there, and then I stayed in this barn. There were a lot of snakes and bears <laughs> and wildlife happening. It was wild. It was good. And um, I went through her house. As I was going through her house, I got a special tour from a man named Peter. And you'll hear his name in the poem. And Peter kind of takes care of the house and the, the Edna St. Vincent Millay Society. He's the director. And um, we were going through the house. And I've done this before, seeing other, you know, when you go to like a famous house and like, here's the nightgown and here's the typewriter and here's the coffee spoon and here's the, you know, fly swatter. And so um, we got to a point in our tour where Peter pulled out a manila envelope and then he took out hair. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you, I didn't know you were gonna take out hair. And so he took out Malay's hair and she had this brilliant, brilliant red hair when she was alive. She was known for this, this gorgeous kind of uh, halo of, of bright red hair. And when he pulled out her hair, you could still see some of its fire. And so, um, this poem is kind of about that time in my life where I was looking at my own fires, fires uh, that I had caused and fires that I, I had kind of come upon by accident. Some of you may have had fires in your lives too. The Reckoning of Relics. This is the gristle of imagery, the need to see what is past, not history, not the before or long ago, but the saint's finger, the sarcophagus of imagery, the immortal phrases of headstones somewhere after death, a detail remains and sits in the mind, brightly impenetrable as a mineral, lapis lazuli or diamonds, 
It was June in Austerlitz when I was circling the stalls of my life, flinging kerosene over what I had done wrong. The stars slid over hummingbirds in the evening. White-tailed deer neared me, then turned away in the meadow's lumina. Beneath apple trees, I sat and rubbed my hands across the bark of my own skin and the red compass within my ribcage. One afternoon, Peter walked me through Malay's house, asked me to imagine the house, the woman's work, the mask. I was staying in the barn, invisible from her windows, taking a month to heal the broken flames of my phoenix, the better woman prepared for flight. I walked for hours, miles, became a ghost, returned from ash, wrote to Tracy, climbed trees, met black snakes and barred owls, breathed like a firefly, alone, a frame of light in a museum, without a painting inside, without a self-portrait. In the morning, high grass floated beneath dew, and I listened to my new flesh, the truer poem. The listening saved me. Even when my ears bled and my heart leaked, I stood at the window inside my own head and looked out at the loping black bear, the pinions of black crows, the thickets of youth flattening beneath my whispers. Upstairs, Peter held his palm out to me, the hush and eternity of a dead woman's curls faded with threads of red. So I'm going to swing back toward Frida. And um, I'd like to share a poem. And I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, then maybe the next poem or two that I read are going to be specifically, I often write ekphrastic poems. Ekphrastic poems are poems written in conversation with visual art, with any kind of form of visual art. And so um, I'm very interested in ekphrastic works because I also am a visual artist. Um, and so it's interesting um, to kind of be able to look through multiple angles at the same jewel and try to shine light in it and, and see what I can. Um, and so that was kind of my aim when I went down to Mexico City, um, was to see the landscape, to climb temples, to learn about Mayan and Aztec cultures, um, and to just completely immerse myself. Poets get obsessed about the most random things and the most serious things and minor things and beautiful things. And so I figured I couldn't really write about Frida Kahlo until I got super obsessed with her. But I was glad that I was obsessed with her, um, not when I was 17 or 18, but as, as, an, older, as an older woman. Um, and so I found out um, Frida died. The title of this poem is July 13th, 1954. And um, this is the day that Frida died. Um, and it's uh, a story a story, or it may be true, which is also a lot about how Frida works, a story which may be true, um, was that as she was being cremated, she sat up, her body sat up, and her hair was kind of on flames, and she seemed to kind of be in that spirit of, of the day of the dead, that kind of energy. And so even then, um, in a lot of uh, Latina culture, um, there's this kind of black humor about kind of skeletons and bones dressed up and like partying and having a good time. And so it seems ironic that in her last kind of exit that Frida herself would sit up um, and do this. And then on my last day that I was at Casa Azul in Mexico, um, I had been going through the house, the gardens, day after day. I had been coming um, back to the house to look and look and look. And when I thought I had looked at everything, I realized I had looked at nothing and I'd have to start all over again. And so um, on the very last day, I had kept coming back to this room. And 
if you ever get to go, some of you may have gone, um, maybe you'll know. There's, there's this little kind of fat little lizard ceramic kind of creature. And I kept looking at it like, what the hell is that? Like, what's going on with that? And so um, finally, uh, a very kind man who worked there told me those are her, her ashes are in this, this little kind of Colombian, uh, it's like a little Colombian idol kind of creature. And so I'm like, ah, oh, that's why I've been, I keep coming back in here, that, that was it. Um, and so that was kind of beautiful to, to see that and that she's in her home. And then the last thing I'll say, because I've probably talked too much already about it. Um, July, for some reason, in my own life, personally, has been an, an, a month um, for the last two or three years where I seem to lose people in July. And it's very ironic in like summertime that you kind of witness death or someone dying that you care about. Do you all know what I mean? You're like, <laughs> OK. So there's an epigram, which is from Frida herself. I live on air, accepting things as they come. July 13th, 1954. Because you sat upright, not yet ash, already myth, yes, Frida, already. Spine broken into bone silence, you sat upright near fire, preparing as the phoenix must gather her fires to die. Lady Lazarus whispering inside your silence, fitting the body into lightning, the faces painted and photographed, a furnace of dreams, waits in paradise. Because we gathered around your ribs, your hundreds of convex embraces and dignities, near the immortal needle of desire, you'll twist perpetually out of reach and paint, pleasure, blazing your night hair and soft bones descend through the canopy to kiss your coverlet of skin. I never write an elegy for you, Frida, but once in late spring, I lingered in a sky of laments at the top of the stairs in your house, the last room, on the last day, a man with eyes like burning, told me she is still here. He pointed out the urn, shaped and brown, like a humble creature of the earth, glazed by the hands of a tarnish that glazes anything worthwhile. Pre-Columbian, two clay arms extended to hold your fatted death and afterlife life. I don't always tell where she is, he said in Spanish, his voice splitting like a fruit. Frida, there is a death mask of your face on the canopied bed. Above, God waits like a mirror. In the corner, the painted leg in its red boot waiting to dance. I am talking to you, naming comets and my deaths in your name. This poem is called Self Traction, and it's in conversation with a photograph of Frida Kahlo. Um, she, she, as some of you know, she had a, a very traumatic injury when she was quite young that would kind of shade many aspects of her life and kind of how she um, projected herself. Um, in my mind, she's the empress of selfies. Like <laughs> Frida Kahlo is, you know, the self E. Um, and so, uh, what do I want to say? There's photographs of her. One of the things in the book that I wanted to do actually was look at how Kahlo was represented and the in photography, photographs of her, portraits of her with the kind of presence of reality. So I need some kind of reality when I take a photograph, even though I can project an inner world on it or a mood or make it feel um, as many of my images are like other world worldly, like I'm listening to another dimension visually in many of my own photographs and their voices. And so um, this particular poem, there's a portrait of Frida in traction. She has this like kind of white um, bandage that's going around her neck. If you Google it, um, 
it'll probably come up immediately. And her lover took it. She had many um, lovers, male and female, and so did Diego, her, her husband, who was a very famous um, Mexican painter as well. And so this poem is called Self-Traction, and it has an epigraph by um, one of my favorite poets, W.S. Merwin. The lightning has shown me the scars of the future. Self-traction. They pull the woman up in her bed. New bandages clasp her face in white. They pull her legs down because she is trying to fly. Beneath wounds, you will find water, skin, lust, longing. These are our strokes of faith. They pull the woman up in her bed. Moonlight seduces the death flaring in her eyes. They pull her legs down, then pull her dress away to shame her thorns. They pull God out of the folds of her skin. They do not let her thoughts peel her head. Her tears sculpt a world. They pull this woman up in her bed. She has been moved to her grave to make them more comfortable. Beneath the gauze, her breasts flutter, stuffed with starlings in the ecstasy of cobalt pigment. She is a cardinal lost in the hive of language. Her song has no pain, but offers mercy anyway. They place a stone beneath her teeth, dare her to bear down on black roots and shatter. In agony and gold leaf, she laughs. They push the body to the edge of the bed to study their incisions. It is a wick, the body they want to drag through fire, effigy. They pull the woman up in her bed, not liking her sounds because she is free. A mind is a socket in lightning when it flies, I said. They pull the light out of her skin pull the lilacs out of her skull, pull the poems wet and writhing out of her, wringing the body in opposite directions until this line is perfectly straight. Thank you. I, uh, I don't have my, my timer, so I'm trying to, uh, how are we? Do you have time okay, for like one? About, about five more minutes. Okay, great, good. I know exactly what I am with. Um, so the last poem I'd like to read from you comes from a very different um, geography of the book. Um, as I was working on this book, toward the end of the book, a number of things um, happened um, and are continuing to happen in this country. And so one of the kind of, I, w I can't say muse, one of the great griefs that happened while I was working on this book was, was the murder of Trayvon Martin. And after that, it seemed to open and open and there, were, there was more, there was more grief, there was more blood, there were more bullets, there were more misconversations, there were more silences. Um, and so, as a poet, um, one of my own, for me as a poet, one of my critical um, responsibilities is for me to be a witness and to try to speak, record, share, interrogate the context of our world um, and of ourselves, particularly here in this country. And so um, I'm going to read a poem that um, in the book, it, it started, it began with uh, the murder of Trayvon Martin, but then it just, it kept opening and opening up. And then I realized it was going backwards as much as it was going forwards. Um, so I had to look back um, and then look forward. And then more happened, as you all know, and more will happen, as you all know. Um, so the first part of the poem 
is uh, I'm an ancestor. The voice is an ancestor. So the eye is an ancestor looking backwards and looking forwards. And then the second part of the poem, which Dr. Gabin talked about call and response, is a we voice. And the we is the, are the voices, um, both of those murdered and both those, those of us still walking around and trying to speak to this. And I just, I'm looking forward to conversation and want to say thank you so much for having me here. I'm really grateful, it means a lot to me. Elegy. I remember the boys and their open hands, high fives of farewell. I remember that the birches waved too, the white jagged limbs turning away from incessant wildfires. The future wavered, unlike a question, unlike a hand or headstone. The future moved and the fields already knew it. I remember the war of the alphabet, its ears sliced from its face. I know that language asked for blood. The children of kudzu, lilac, the spit of unknown rivers. I remember the jury and the judge of the people, the buckshot that blew the morning's torso into smoke. That last morning, I begged the grandmothers to leave their rage next to red candles and worn photographs of their children. I scattered the stones the trees bore. Gray vultures came from my children. They knew the old country better than me. They broke through skyscrapers and devoured both villain and hero. And boys, black boys, were pouring, wanted and unwanted, and missing yet from the long mouth where they were forced to say they were nothing. But they were men, invisible and native and guilty and innocent beyond their glottal doubt. I remember calling out to the savage field where more black boys knelt and swung through the air. I remember how their eyes rolled back in blood, milk, and gasoline, their white teeth chewing cotton into shrouds, scars, and sheets. They gave me their last words. They gave me smiles for their fathers. They slept in my arms dead and bruised, long as branches, the bullets and their heads and groins quieting like a day, the meat of nothing. I held their million heads in my laps when the black bodies were taken away. I don't know if what's left will dance or burn. I washed their eyelids with mint. Let God beg pardon to them and their mothers. And I don't know if the body is a pendulum of where love cannot go when the tongue is swollen with the milk of black boys. I pulled their lives from the trees and lawns and schools, the unlit houses and the river, their four wings wet with clouds and screaming, but I won't leave them. Huddled like bulls inside the stalls of our words, I am the shriek, the suture, the rose petal shook loose from their silence. The faces of our deaths are unresolved. The black body identified is confirmed by music, ragtime, big band blood. We all look alike. We're prayers. The coroner's baby grand piano in a cold drawing room. We were not identified by our teeth, broken, or by our country, broken. These are the words we will not be. 
Will you finish this poem or give the back of its mouth the gun? The hearts terracotta blue were buried beneath the birches, drop bread from the hands that push sentences into our cages. Murder the grooms and Apollos, drag your chariots over the head of Orpheus, where a headless agony rolls like a kickball in a Jasper, Texas road. The business of caretakers, bet on that staying platinum. The more black you buy and bury, the harder heaven shines its pennies. Bless our nation of uncertain chambers, bludgeon our American orchestra with the blues. Plastic bags of glory going for a name on any corner where a pickup game distracts the night from the black bruise swinging and the jaundice of a street light. The metaphors grieve our own offspring. Our riddles are tired of numbers and bony ghettos. The scandal of marrow as the black body witnesses our gaze. The crap game of black boys in repose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just so moved. <sighs> Your last comment before you read the poem was sort of prophetic because um, this morning I just saw another image and it's real close to home folks. It's at the University of Virginia on St. Patrick's Day two days ago. A young man with everyone else trying to get into a crowded bar and he was singled out and policemen slammed him to the ground, put a cut in his head where, that would require 10 uh, stitches and then held him there, cuffed him there and it was all about innocence. There was no reason to do it. We are going to be in trouble if decent people like yourselves don't rise up in indignation about what is going on in our country. And this poem just took me through what it is that I just can't stomach about where we live and the racism that we tolerate. <sighs> so, that's what poetry does for me. It makes me human. Yes. It makes me human. So, <sighs> the floor is open for your questions in your comments, but while you're thinking of something to say, I want to thank uh, the Center for Instructional Technology and Jessica for taking down these images so we can have in our archive this beautiful woman expressing herself. I want to make sure that that's not lost. Um, all right, a question, a comment. Yes. Well, I would like to uh, thank you both. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Joanne's comments following up are actually a call to action. And that's what artists do. Artists observe what's going on in the world. And they're a call to action because with their words, or with their art, or with their music, or with their dance, with their creativity,
creative writing, with their performance, they're able to show the world things that we might not see otherwise. Mm -hmm. Through this beautiful reading today, we see and experience something that should be so obvious to us. As Joanne said, it was in the paper this morning. This morning, we should be horrified by this. So an artist who can stand up and with dignity shed some light onto something that we might otherwise miss is really someone to thank and someone to honor. And the challenge to the rest of us is to try to hear what she's saying or to try to see what she's showing in the images. We recently just had an uh, exhibition in the gallery from artist Jefferson Pinder, who touched on many of these same things. And he told us, he said, I really hope that viewers, when they look at my work, it can actually change behavior. And we had a wonderful discussion. Can art do that? Can art, it's such a challenge for the artist to put forth work that's so moving, but the question is, can it change behavior? It can, but only if we as the viewers and the participants agree to participate in the discussion. So we must listen, and we must see, and try to understand what the artists and the poets are trying to tell us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Anyone with a question or a comment? Anything is allowed, I think. Yes. I'm just curious, like, how did you um, get interested in writing poetry? Mm -hmm. Like, what made you want to start writing poetry? Um, like, have you always liked to write? Or is it something like happened in life that, like, um, you wanted to write about? And you were like, oh, whatever, let's do this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, let's see, I've always written poetry. I was the kid who, if you just gave me, like, some paints and a pencil and put me in a closet, well not in a closet, but if you put me to the side, I would just be, I always wanted to create from a very early age. So I have memories of being like four or five years old and trying to like write a story out or draw pictures and like, here's this and this and like all gibberish, but that desire to like share or to like make a story. Um, I think um, this for me is kind of, it's a gift and at the same time that there, it's a, there's a lot to go with it. Um, I don't think I could do anything else and I'm glad I realized that early on. But I, this has kind of sat with me and keeps me company all the time and it's, it's wonderful. Um, so the poetry, the visual art, um, I'm writing a novel right now. So I kind of really just the arts, the humanities and I, I again, I wanna emphasize what has been said is that just kind of intersecting with the arts in your life helps you, helps you um, cultivate empathy and imagination to kind of always be looking at someone else's perspective, prevents you from making them the other person or, or from giving yourself permission because they don't look like you or they're not like you. Because as an artist, I'm always trying to see out as many different eyes and perspectives as possible. And so um, since I was quite small, um, I was, I was always like that. I always wanted to kind of, had these kind of Pan's Labyrinth, Coraline vibe where there were just worlds everywhere. Um, and I, I still kind of am like that most of the time, that there, there are a lot of things happening and if I'm open, I can receive so much and then I, and I, I can give so much. And, and that exchange is really critical to me as an artist and also just as a person in the world, you know? Thank you. Great question. Yes. Uh, so I really enjoy these today. One question I have for you is how do you see in your writing, um, have you ever intersected with um, music or dance um, to help inspire your poetry? Mm. 
Um, that's a great question, mm -hmm. thank you. Music is, is pretty critical to how I make poems. Um, I am someone who constantly reads aloud every day because poetry for me is so lyrical, um, it's so musical, it's an oral tradition, and so I have to hear my voice speaking the language, and when I have a really crappy line, the minute I read it aloud, I'm like, oh, Eliza, this is bad. And I read it again, and I'm like, you're snagging. This is a bad line. You like this adjective, but it's a no-go on this line, you know? So my ear is a really profound editor, um, and I just, I love, there's something about music. Um, I love all kinds of music, like Johnny Cash, Nina Simone. Um, in New York, I, I check out jazz musicians pretty, that's like a regular kind of like spiritual practice to hear live music, pretty much anywhere, any kind of music, but just the instruments and watching people breathe and like, it, and it's amazing. Um, and so music is definitely something um, that I feel is, a, is a, a very integral part as far as how I, I write. Um, and then I would say as far as dance goes, um, I would love to collaborate with a dancer um, or a dance troupe or like a dance kind of group to do work, but I have never written um, kind of anything with dance or, or anything like that. I've had some of my poems set to music. I've had um, some wonderful singers like sing my poems. Um, I have some musician friends of mine who were thinking of doing like a little like EP kind of thing. Um, but I'm kind of shy most of the time, so I'm like, I don't know how that will work out. But, but music and dance, I mean, I love to watch dance. It's just extraordinary to watch that the body can just, with music, mm -hmm. wonderful. And you can sort of see in her photographs a kind of desire to choreograph. Yeah. Don't you see that? She had... Um, all kinds of poets up in our trees, right out here. Yes, I did. Oh, that's right good. out here. So <laughs> before this became mm -hmm. what it is now, mm -hmm. they were in the trees. Mm -hmm. Yes, some great trees on this campus. <laughs> That's a, I mean, that's a really great question. Now that I think about it, I, I, photograph, I photograph men infrequently, not, not very often. And usually if I do photograph men, they maybe identify as trans or they're, they're shapeshifters in identity. Um, the women in the trees, I, I, um, I, oh, I feel so vulnerable right now, but I'm just gonna say it, I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna, put it, I'm gonna share it with you all. Um, from a young age, I loved trees. I would climb them. I would kind of, they were really like, they, I'm very connected to trees. I find them very powerful. Um, and several years ago, I, I was, um, I think I was outside of Pittsburgh and I passed a tree and I saw women in it. But there, I mean, there weren't really women in it, but there, but for me there were and I saw them and they're always wearing white. This is the kind of almost inner life thing that it's, when I put it into the air, it starts to turn different colors than how it lives inside me. But um, there's some kind of spirituality. They they're almost always have to wear white. And there's something about um, time that changes, that they're, they're not necessarily attached to a certain year. or to, to, You can't say like, oh, that's 80s, or that's 90s, or that's anything. Um, even though many of the models in the images are all either poets I beg to be models for me or they're models I've hired um, to, to work with. Um, but also in some cultures, white means death and in other cultures, white is a baptism. So the, 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 white, the whiteness has a um, complexity as much as the black skin of the women and the women's black identity is to me very complex. And I think my particular examination of um, women of color 
is in a way an examination of myself. Um, Frida said she painted herself the most because she knew herself the best. And so um, when I am photographing women of color, there's a conversation that's happening. Um, there's a lot of kind of sense of, for me, time collapsing. I don't really think of the past as the past. I always am carrying it with me. Um, in the present and the future, like in my mind, time has collapsed in a way where, and I think you all know with memory, right, how memory works um, or doesn't work sometimes. That it, there's just, I don't say like that happened yesterday in a, in a certain like creative way. It, it means something else to me. Um, so I, I'm, try, I'm really struggling to try to say something about the women, but they're, there's something about being a woman and being a woman of color and nature. I write about nature a lot in my poems and even though I live in Brooklyn, I have animal incidents all the time. I'm always seeing like hawks and like raccoons and foxes and someone will be like, weren't you down on your street? I'm like, this red tail hawk went by. I'm like, this only happens to you, Eliza. But this kind of, you know, um, sense of the animal. I have a lot of respect for animals and animal life and kind of intuition is the dominant engine in, in most of my photographs, not the technical, the, it's, it's intuition, it's elusive, it's like dreams, almost overhearing them visually and trying to say these things to look at these bones. So that's wonderful. Yeah. One more question. And um, just before I get this last question, I want to let you know that um, we have Rachel's books in the back. Those of you who'd like to purchase a book from the bookstore, please purchase a book. She will sign it for you and personalize it, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I, I saw one hand back there. Okay, all right. Uh, come up closer, uh, uh, Tosin, and, uh, and so I can get to you very quickly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Do you have prints? <clears throat> no, I don't. Thank Not you. right now. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful comment. Yeah, you can have Thank comments so too. Yeah. Wasn't that sweet? Aren't, aren't they wonderful students? They are really wonderful. <laughs> I feel really good right now. What was, wait, the poem that I read before? The, the one because I came into the end of it. Mm -hmm. The one from before the Trayvon Martin one. Oh, oh. a lot of like great I'm trying to like work 
work my mind like, like a bee, like get around that hive. Okay. Um, when I, I think to clarify with history, I, I'm a very like old spirit. So um, when I, I'm drawn to, when I say that history has collapsed, that means I, I bring older times with me. Like that is always present to me, a sense of an older, older world and an older dimension. Um, even when I was young, I just felt very old and felt like there's just, there's a lot of the, like the world has been around for a long time and there's a lot of, and there's a lot more. I don't, I don't know how to say it without sounding like super mystical and dream catchery right now, but I'll say that um, I'm drawn to kind of old things and I feel that there are historical narratives that still have not been spoken, that have still not been said. And so visually they come they come, I think they come through what I'm looking at. So sometimes I can look at someone walking down the street and see like a hundred years ago in their face or the way that they're moving or something and I feel as though I'm looking from some, at someone who's come through a window and is here or just that kind of shape of that person. Um, the, women, um, the women in the photographs are sometimes they are people, women I know. Um, when I first started out as a photographer, I was way too shy to like try to find models. I would just ask friends who I felt comfortable with if they would be models. And many of them are poets. So they have this kind of dramatic or internal energy. I wanted to push away at the kind of like flat absorption of black women's bodies and to really have a sense of something happening beneath the surface in these women. Um, and so I have a folio here, but I work with all sizes, shapes, palettes, colors, complexions, um, class, that's a, that's a whole different thing too, um, diaspora. And so um, for me, there's kind of the photographer's logistics of how, you know, how things kind of get arranged and organized. And then sometimes if I have a particular sketch that I've made kind of in my notebooks of what I want to do. I may say, this woman needs to be 5'11 and have this kind of frame, or because I often work um, mostly as a black and white photographer, contrast of black, grays, whites, um, texture also will affect the kind of woman I, I'd like to work with. Um, there are certain women, it, you know, it's, it will sound strange, but like if I want to do blur, their, their, their body may not work with blur. It may, it may not give me the result that I'm actually looking for. Um, only this past summer did I actually start to really put, place myself in self-portraits in the same way that I've placed women. So now it seems even more kind of interesting to me to be both taking my own picture and be the object of my own picture. Um, that's a whole rich kind of space now too, but um, there's, there's definitely for me some uh, dignity and integrity every time I work with a model. Um, and I, a mo how a model feels is always more important than me getting a good photograph, because that's a human being. So there, there's that for me. Um, some of you who came to the last reading that we did, uh, Camilla Aisha Moon, anybody here? Uh, did some of you notice her picture? Did you? Uh, she, was, she was there. She's a good friend. Uh, those of you who came to the conference saw um, probably Aracelis Germay. She was there. Um, Evie Shockley, she was there. You know, if you were looking closely, if you know these people, this has been thrilling. You know, I'm going to let you go while you want more. I want you to clap in an amazing way for this woman.